Okay, so welcome back to a, I guess, another episode of LinkedIn Live. And we are talking about how toxic workspaces impact Black women. So last week, I had a panel with Dr. Tracy and Cheryl, and they kind of talked about it from being in a, in a school system and as a social worker and as an educator. This week, I have an interesting panel as well. So I have my Lawn Sullivan, I have Tammy C. Av, and I have Don Robinson, and I have Danny smith Mathis. So... I'm going to allow these ladies to introduce themselves, and then we're going to go right ahead and jump into our questions for this week. So, Mylon, let's start with you. Introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, everyone. My name is Mylon Sullivan. I am a licensed social worker um, and licensed independent chemical dependency counselor, as well as a program manager and a consultant. Um, you can reach my website at advocating the number four change.com. That's advocating the number four change.com. All right, thank you, my lawn and Tammy. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tammy Shantal Amy, and I am just ecstatic about being here with all of you this evening. Uh, my background is a little bit all over the place from legal to the medical field. Um, so let me just explain some of these um, alphabet soups behind my name. I'm a professional digital court reporter, certified professional compliance officer, a professional medical coder, and medical auditor. I am also the formal regional manager for Operation Warp Speed, Regions 9 and 10, that covers um, all of the uh, Pacific and coastal um, areas, such as Hawaii, California, Arizona, Nevada, and many of the um, U.S. territories. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Tammy. And Dawn, or Attorney Dawn. Well, um, hi, everyone. And it's great to be here with all these beautiful Black sisters. Um, coming together for a certain cause. And my background is in electrical engineering. And I also have a Juris Doctorate in Law, as Dr. Carey pointed out. And I have 30 years of experience in research and development of building complex systems, as well as program management um, as well. So I'm excited about being here and look forward to the questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And last but not least, now you all might remember Danny from our first anthology, Shut Them Down. Well, guess what? She is back again with another blazing <laughs> chapter. So, Danny, reintroduce yourself to everybody, girlfriend. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrie. It is so good to be back with you or to still be with you. I never really went anywhere. Um, yes, I'm Danny Smith Mathis. Uh, I was in the corporate workplace for over 30 years until I decided to turn away from systemic racism and a toxic workplace that's um, intentionally uh, marginalized my existence or sought to marginalize my existence. So having said that, I am now the CEO and president of my company, Danielle Mathis Inc., which is a proposal management company here based here in the Hampton Roads, Virginia area. Thank you for having me. Thank you, my sisters in writing, and thank you, our chief, our chief, Dr. Carrie Yazi. You are welcome. Glad to have you back. And thank you to everyone who is joining us tonight from all over the world. So we are happy to have you. Now, my only thing is, if you're going to comment in the chat, I need you to be nice. We respect each other's differences. We don't try and tear each other down. Um, if you have a question and you can put it in the chat and if we have time, we'll be happy to answer it or maybe someone else in the chat can answer it for you. So this is a big community and we are here to share and to grow together. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right in with question number one. Um, our first question is, what is the most toxic workspace in which you were employed? Mylon, would you like to start first? Sure. 
Um, so my background is in community mental health. Um, and I worked for an agency. I didn't even make it my probationary period, and the probationary period was 90 days. Um, I had a supervisor who she was probably about 30 or 40 years my senior at the time, um, but she treated everybody the same. So she kind of reminded you of like an uh, a great aunt or a grandmother, but it was literally like that for everybody, no matter if you were younger, older, or her same age. Um, and so one of the things that she would do, she would be really, really aggressive in the way that she would, and she really wouldn't even ask us to do anything, not even the courtesy of asking. She would literally be like, go pick up that client, or I, you don't do this, um, or like there would be no direction, um, and the interesting thing about that particular role is that I helped write the manual for the program. Um, and so I knew all the ins and outs of how the program was supposed to be and the funding that went behind the program. And so even within those 70 days that I stayed, um, I did a lot for the program and she probably was one of the worst supervisors I've ever had. And the agency actually backed her. And I found out even a couple of years later, she ended up getting fired. And she would pawn me between her and the COO. Um, they had like this, it was really, it was really strange, this, this relationship, they, they would always go back and forth. And so one person would ask me to do something and another person would ask me to do the exact opposite on purpose. It was a really, really, really bad environment. So I end up leaving with probably about a five day notice. Um, I couldn't even do a two week. And I got out of there as quickly as possible. I end up calling um, an old supervisor and say, hey, take me back. <laughs> and they did. And it's been way better ever since. Okay, so it sounds like you actually left an environment that the uh, old environment, uh, one environment, and went back to an old environment because it was just a better fit for you as far as just overall. Yeah, it was just something I needed to hurry up and leave quickly. And I, I never left the job on a bad note. So it wasn't hard for me to call an old supervisor and say, hey, can I come back? And they were like, oh, absolutely. And I'm like, can I come back like tomorrow? Um, and they will yeah. get it. <laughs> Got <laughs> it. So, Tammy, what about you? Have you, has there been, well, we know there's been a toxic working, but what's been like the worst work environment you found yourself in? The absolute worst, the worst um, was in 2018 through 2019, one of the companies that I worked for. Um, I literally experienced what it meant to be marginalized and literally targeted day in and day out because of the color of your skin. Um, I was in an environment in a healthcare um, field where in this particular health management company, they would categorize what jobs you were allowed to apply for and or advance to based on the color, your pigmentation. So um, for example, there were certain jobs that were, the doors were completely closed to you um, because of your race. So if you applied and you knew you were qualified and you would follow up and you were, you're like, well, what do I need to do in order to advance into that role? And they would tell you, well, there's really nothing that you can do because we would require you to have um, this. You, you would need to go get a master's degree or a PhD in X, Y, Z. And then you would find out that someone else who had only a high school diploma had that exact same position and was earning 20 or $30,000 a year more than you. So although you had many years of experience, perhaps you even performed the job as the interim and you still weren't good enough. Um, in that particular environment, I literally had to deal with um, being afraid to leave my desk and go to the restroom because they would dock my pay or follow me to the bathroom to confirm where I was located. 
it was just so overbearing and so toxic that at the end, I ended up being the last black woman standing. All of the others had either been fired or they had quit and filed EEOC complaints. And it took, it wreaked havoc on my health. It took a great toll on me. Um, and that's one of the things that I wanna share with people tonight later on as we get into our discussion. But um, this is something that will impact you mentally, physically, and your marriage just, it touches every aspect of your life when you're stuck in a toxic dead end environment. Yes, I totally agree. And Don, you are shaking your head, but I know you can relate to some of the things that Tammy just spoke on because I know you yourself have went through some of those things. So please kind of yeah. share with the audience. Yeah, um, as Tammy was speaking, I could relate to everything she said and forgive me for getting a little emotional because it does affect your, um, your, your health, your stability. Um, in my particular case, I was in research and development and I was in medical device development, which was class three medical devices, the ventilator systems that you see people talking about because of COVID. I was responsible for the next generation of that device going to market. And I had over 75 engineers reporting to me as a senior program manager. And one particular individual resented the fact that I was in charge. I was black, I was female. And he went as far as going down to HR to validate whether I had an electrical engineering degree and whether I had a law degree. So they did a second background check on me to validate whether my credentials were correct first. Then he start targeting the president and telling the president how bad I was in doing the job, even though my team loved and supported me and we were kicking butt. He kept going behind my back and putting, spreading rumors into the president's ear, the VP's ear, because he resented the fact that I had the most visible high profile project in the company, which was a, um, you know, a very large fortune 500 company. And he resented that. And then, in turn, uh, for a moment, he um, became my boss because of uh, things that changed in, 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 in the company structure. And he became my boss and my performance rating, he rated me below average when I was outstanding and above average before then. And a new VP had come in and they put me on a performance review. I never in my career have been on a performance plan and they put me on a performance plan and I had to deal with that. I had to say, look, I'm the same person that I was when I was managing all these other projects and producing results. Why? What has changed? I haven't changed. So what has changed? So nevertheless, I had to do this performance um, plan and I kicked butt on that. And then at the end, they fired him. And they came back because they knew that I could have a lawsuit against them. And they gave me a promotion and a 10% increase in pay so that I would keep my mouth shut about the things that I had gone through working for this guy. And by the way, I was pregnant at the time too. So you have a black female pregnant at the time. You know, all I can do is just take a deep breath because I can relate to some of the stuff that, that you share. And and it is disheartening when you like, you know, you know, you're qualified, but then they go behind your back to double check that you're qualified and then still come up with all these reasons of why you're, quote unquote, not good enough. You can't perform your job when clearly all the evidence showed that you were more than qualified, you know? And I know, Don, you talk about, you really go more in depth in your chapter in the book, but thank you for sharing that as well. Before we um, go over to Danny, we did have a comment from um, the chat. It's from Cheryl and she said, in a toxic work environment, black women have to watch others advance while the bar for advancement continues to move for black women. And so basically that's what, you know, Don and, and, and Tammy were sharing is that there's a bar, but then when you start to reach that bar, then they move the bar a little bit higher 
um, and then come back and tell you, well, you're not living up to the expectations and they put us on performance reviews and all of this. And you're sitting there saying, well, wait a minute. You know, I thought I was doing pretty good, but you, and then they don't tell you that the bar has been risen. That's the catcher. So we do go through a lot. Danny, share with us your most toxic work experience. My most toxic work experience was with a company that prided itself on its values so much that it gave what they called an annual values award. That award was given to the top 20 to 25 people annually in the company who had proven process improvement in their particular areas of expertise. In my case, that area of expertise was proposal management. One year after I became employed at that company, I won a $10,000 cash award and some other things that went with it. But it, the award was the thing that, it, that by no means could it be taken from you that you had gotten that. In fact, your picture stayed in the hallway in that corporation for one year until the next, the incoming awardees came. And every year it was changed out. So it's kind of like a wall of fame. Well, that wall of fame for me became <clears throat> an intentional design for a wall of shame. And what I mean by that is the microaggression that I experienced from two superiors who were of lesser color than myself. And they, because they were basically jealous of my aptitude, they purposed to forge a new narrative of me that would make those who did not know me as well because of so many mergers and acquisitions that had taken place. And so therefore lots of chess people moving around the board corporately in departments, out of departments, even out of the company. And so I found myself in a place with basically someone's foot on my neck and I could not breathe. And it was very difficult for me to do my work. And I questioned my own worth. I questioned my own professional expertise as a writer, an expertise that had been in me since I was nine years old. So for over 50 years. Now you have to understand, I was dealing with also generational diversity. I was in four I think four protected classes. I was a woman. I was black. I was uh, in, I was um, over fifty five. So I guess three protected classes. That's a lot of protected classes all at one time. But even more so than that, what a corporation will do is most corporations that have a weak HR need people like me because they will make HR seem as though they're for you particularly if the HR folks are of your persuasion and they will make it seem like they really want to work with you so that you can have um, an amicable experience going forward when people are in designing your experience exclusively to destroy you. That was my most toxic experience. Wow. Yeah, I definitely can relate to that. And and I like the point that you made. Um, well, I don't like it, but it was a good point that you made, um, Danny, when you said how like the narrative is kind of is set up where you think they're celebrating you. But really, it's like this setup and it's this setup for your big downfall for, you know, and and again, it becomes something that we don't even see that is about to take place or happen to us. 
And, you know, we have women in the chat. Um, Brandy just said that she's currently experiencing, you know, everything that, that we all are sharing tonight. She's going through that. Um, and then we have Veronica and she says, Sally, this is happening too much. And I agree, Veronica, you know, that's one of the reasons why we decided to to actually do the anthology was because I started to realize, like, it wasn't just me. And, and you know, like, I think all of us have shared at some point we felt alone. Um, Dan, like Danny said, you question yourself and, and you know, you, you question like, am I good enough? Like, well, what am I doing wrong? You know, like Don is like, well, I got it engineering degree i got a law degree you know tammy is like over all of these regions and you know my lawn she has like her license and so you know that you are qualified in your field and you know that you are highly trained but when those microaggressions come along racism comes along what it does is it play it it, it is, it's like a mind game and so it goes to the game of 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 chess that Danny talked about, but it's a mental game. And sometimes you don't even know that you're that you're caught up in this game of chess and that you're one of the pieces that's about to get taken off the board. So it is, you know, I really wanted every, women like the ones that I have on tonight, the ones that will be coming next week, the ones we had last week. I, I wanted to give women a platform who were willing to share their stories because it happens a lot but a lot of black women are afraid to speak up they are afraid to use their voice because you know sometimes you need your job you got kids you we all got bills you know there is no backup plan or you haven't thought of your backup plan and it can get kind of scary but i think the more that we continue to talk about this and to share we a start to see that other people, women can see I'm not by myself. I'm not alone. I really am good at what I do. It's not me. It's them. And I think that is the most important thing. If you don't take anything else away from this discussion tonight, please take that away from, from this discussion. Please, please, and please. So we are going to move into our, um, our next question. And our next question is, has there ever been a time where you were told to make someone else successful and not given a chance to do the job yourself? Who wants to tackle that one first? I'll go. Okay, Don. Well, you know, it, it seems to be repetitive. It happens often in our careers. It just is not a one-time or one-off situation. It seems to happen at every job I've gone in bed that this situation presents itself. So in this particular case, they were I was working for a major biopharmaceutical company, and it was a very old plant, and they were building a brand new facility with all the bells and whistles and stuff like that to produce... Um, Drug, drug, drug products. In any event, in building this brand new facility, they put this guy in charge uh, to program manage it, and he had to manage vendors, contractors, and so forth. Now, senior management knew my background, and they wanted me to do the job because they saw that this person was failing in doing the job. He wasn't meeting his commitments. He wasn't um, abreast of the technology and so forth. We would sit in meetings. I would be the one that asked all the pertinent questions, the questions that got to the heart of the matter. And senior leadership took note of that and said, Don should be the one to manage this project moving forward. So I had a meeting with the VP. And he said to me, point blank, that I needed to come in and make this guy successful. Are you kidding me? You know, okay, you want me to make him successful? What about my opportunity to lead a major program and, and, and have all the accolades and the experience behind me? But no, you want me to take my experiences and background and come in and make him successful where he will get the credit for everything that we do right. And, and I just sit back and no one recognizes me. So there you have it. And you, you know that happens more often than not, right? 
Yeah, you know, like this director came in and it was an IT project. And I actually configured it, did the use cases, the flow diet, business processes and so forth. This director came in, I had to teach him the tool. I had to sit down and tutor him, teach him the tool front and back, all the things associated with the tool, why we were doing it, what the processes were, everything about that tool. And then he took credit and moved forward with it. Mm. And he was he was tasked to do that. He was tasked to go sit with Dawn and learn the tool. And then they gave it to him. But you know, Dawn, I think it happens. I think in your situation, they told you a lot yeah. of times they don't even let us know what's going on. Like they'll say, oh, well, can you train this person? And you don't know that that you're getting set up to train your boss, train your, your, your the income and supervisor that just started at the company. And you know way more than they do. Right. You know? I mean, I think the shocker for me was just like, oh, wait, they just told you make him successful. So yeah. Yes. 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 You as a person of they knew the quality of your work as a professional mm -hmm. and that you could make him successful. Right. Right. And this was a VP level guy. Oh, girl. So <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you could have been running the whole company. Right. <laughs> Basically, that's that's what I'm hearing is that Dawn training the people to run the company, but she could have really been a sister running the company. How many people does that happen to? Like, who else wants to speak on this? We about to have church up in here tonight. Um, uh, because I amen. got that was a whole amen. Amen. Hey, my long. Yes. And so similar to Dawn, I had um upper management come to me and essentially say, hey, that you have these um, different skills, but we think that you should be able to share them with your supervisor. And it took me <laughs> aback. <laughs> I was like, wait, you, you want me to teach her the skills that I have? Um, but I didn't sign up to be a consultant and a coach in this role. So if we're talking about a different job description or if we're talking about additional responsibilities, I should be compensated for it. And so like even backtracking, usually I'm the youngest person in any room that I'm in. But most people don't expect my responses because usually the people around my age range that they're accustomed to, they're used to just saying, oh, I need experience. So I'll do what you tell me to do. And I have the experience. Um, and the supervisor that was in the role at the time, she had maybe one year, six months more of experience than I do. And they brought it up and was like, well, she's been in the field a lot longer. Actually, I, I got my degree a year after her. She's, she hasn't been in the field that long at all. Um, and then they essentially was like, well, you have other duties as a sign attached to your job description. And so my rebuttal was, well, there are 25 other responsibilities before that other duties, and those take priority because that's what I'm getting paid to do. Um, now, if there, I have no problem being written up if you consider it insubordinate, but I don't think teaching someone else my skills is a part of my job description. And so they essentially kept giving me projects that were indirectly hers but when they first were giving them to me, I didn't know that they were hers. I thought that they were something that should be like attached to my job description. And there were certain things that were like really vague in my job description. It's one of the reasons why I thought it was a part of it. Um, and so after I start monitoring things for a while, I would listen to conversations. So I would be in marketing meetings. Um, mind you, I am a counselor at this time. So I shouldn't be in marketing meetings. I should be out seeing clients. Um, I shouldn't be creating manuals or um, streamlining procedures. I am the person that's essentially, if you think about hierarchy of a business, I'm at the bottom. So the things that I'm doing is upper management. And if you all are not compensating me for it, I eventually I stopped doing it. Um, and they were like, well, we're going to write you up. And I said, well, in the state of Ohio, um, we have these things called addendums. So if you write me up, I have no problem with that, but I need 24 hours to write my addendum. So if 
um, it goes in my HR file, my letters attached to it. They it essentially got to a point where it got so bad there of us going back and forth or just me just being frustrated that I ended up just quitting. Cause I was like, I can't, this, this is ridiculous. I can't. Um, and then I end up just leaving abruptly. And the sad part is that you had to, you know, is you're being asked to do all these things that a, you're not being compensated for, but again, you're being asked to do them. So that means that someone in upper management, just like Dawn, they realize the skills that you have they and so that just tells me when they come in and they ask us to train these people that are in management but they won't give us the management position so instead they will go and hire our counterpart have us to train them so they can then be over us but you are the person who was the trainer i mean somebody make it make sense because it has never made sense to me and and like you said, my lawn, it becomes like that's not your job. Like Kat said, it's not your problem. And if we don't speak up, then they continue to use us because we are that is that is being used, especially when you are not being compensated. They not bringing you in as a consultant. You're being played. You're being played. And at some point, you do have to make that decision of when do when do I say enough is enough and I leave. And unfortunately, that's what happens to like a lot of us. I think, Tammy, you were getting ready to say something um, right with my lawn. Well, first of all, my lawn and, and Don and just everyone. Sorry that we're all here under these pretenses, but um. This is what I have to say, and I'm, I'm getting ready to just lay it on the line and take all the sugar coating off of things. But this is for everyone who has ever been told you are a hard worker. How often are black women told we are hard workers, but you never work hard enough to be good enough to be at the top, to sit at the table, to be recognized. And you're there simply to be somebody's step stool, somebody's doormat so that they can climb up to the next rung of some ladder someplace because they have the right pigmentation. And you have to sit back and keep looking up the ladder as everybody else is stepping on your face while they climb to the top and you have the bruises and the scars on your back to prove it. You've trained them, you've worked with them. In fact, some of them don't even have the same skill sets or qualifications as you and you're wondering how the heck they leapfrog right on top of your head to the top and became your boss. Well, today I just want to say enough is enough. We have the right to sit at the table like anybody else. We are as intelligent, as qualified, in fact, sometimes even more so because to get to the table, we have to be three times more qualified or better than the person standing behind us. I have been there more times than I can tell you and count on one hand, where I was being groomed by someone who had the audacity, according to somebody in corporate management, to have the nerve to think that diversity was a good thing, and saw my skill sets, saw my talents, and was willing to recognize me. And that person ends up subsequently being fired just so that they can find a way to get to me and get me out the door because I'm being too visible. I don't know my place. Yes, I have trained more white men and white women than I can count to do the job that I was already doing. I can't remember and recount the number of times I sat up late at night working on projects that were far above my pay grade and they were willing to take my labor and then give someone else the credit. Enough is enough the struggle continues but we're going to do what we can to make sure that it ends i don't want to see my son or my daughters have to do an interview like this it, we have to move past just talking about it and start getting people who are claiming to be our so-called representatives to actually take what is happening to us seriously and damn it i'm gonna say it's time for somebody to pay thank you 
Okay, so you know, this I'm gonna say amen again. You know, like we in church, amen. I'm Catholic, y'all, but amen, amen, Tim, amen. And and I agree, you know, we have all of these spokespersons and spokeswomen that are out there, but we still going through this. And like you said, Tammy, we're sitting here having discussions and we're writing anthologies and we're sharing stories. And these aren't stories from 20 years ago. These are stories as recently as like last year, you know, or six months ago or maybe two years ago. And so when does this stop? When are we good enough to sit at the table? I mean, we know we're good enough to sit at the table, but when does everyone else realize that we're good enough to sit at the table? And I think that starts when we start speaking up, when we have these hard conversations, and when we say, like you said, Tammy, enough is enough. Like, time out for this. If we're good enough to train someone to be the VP that you bring in, then you need to be looking at me to be the VP. I shouldn't be the one training the VP. I need to be the VP. Like the narrative needs to change, but it's not going to change if we don't speak up and we don't say enough is enough. So thank you so much for that, Tammy. Danny, I know you about to bring this home. So go ahead and, and bring it home real quick because she good at it too. Go ahead, Ms. Danny. So here's the thing. Corporate America, these people that supposedly we feel that they represent us because they look like us, they're in HR, they may even be in positions higher. They, DEI is a joke. It is there. It is there specifically to continue to make us uncomfortable. And see, it's rooted in a legacy that is antithetical to our spirit of our foremothers. We, we, we come everywhere we go. We take the spirit of our foremothers. We are strong, outspoken, because like someone else mentioned, we always have to bring it three times more, three times harder. And we do in many cases, and even more than that. So my discussion in my chapter is about the field of the soil that is particularly designed to germinate an institution that is constructed on hatred. That is a social injustice issue that is deeply embedded within corporate America. And until we say this everyday struggle will not continue. And until we have the courage to say, fine, we will document and we will litigate without apology, without fear. That is where the conversation will change and truth awaits that conversation. And I'm glad that you you brought that up, Danny, um, litigation, because I think, A, because someone in the chat has said, you know, so so how do we, we start with these changes? How do we implement all of these things that, you know, we're talking about when we say enough is enough? How do we move forward? How do we stop training people and say, I want my seat at the table, too? And I think, you know, you all feel free to jump in. I think one of the ways that we we start to challenge the system is that when you speak up, sometimes you do have to speak up with legal litigation. That means that you got to go get lawyered up, like the kids say, get lawyered up. And that, that doesn't mean you go get the criminal lawyer. You go get the employment lawyer. You go get the intellectual property lawyer because some the company has stolen stuff that you have created and you didn't even know about it. Like so many things happen to us, but I think the change has never occurred because a, let's look at the people who are supposed to be our spokespersons who are supposed to be speaking up for us. Well, it's all about money. It's not about making sure that we're okay and we're protected It's how much money they're getting paid and how good does this make them look to say that they are fighting for this cause. I agree, Danny, that I do think DEI in a lot of situations, I see 
people who are VPs of DEI and, you know, they're women of color, not necessarily black, but they women of color or they're men of color, but they're in their positions. They do nothing. They have no power. They have no voice. Don, how you say that? Zero. They not. It is just a position and they are there because the company after the joy of George Floyd, when we saw all of that unfold on social media and we saw this black man being killed by the police and blacks started to speak out, not riot, but blacks started to passionately speak out and say enough is enough. Then companies said, well, we need to we need to put something in place. And so they created all these DEI positions that are powerless that they have no voice, they have no control, they cannot do anything. They are just a figurehead that is there, that is getting paid to sit at the table, but to be quiet. Because see, sometimes you can have a seat at the table, but you don't have a voice. Right. And so what's the point of sitting at the table if you can't speak at the table? What's the point of sitting at the table if you can't eat at the table? What's the point of being at the table if you can't bring other people to the table with you? Who wants to sit at the table by themselves? None of us. Amen. Of us. Can I add something? Yes. Uh, well, you know, this diversity and inclusion is nothing new. I mean, 25 years ago, they went through the same thing. They went through this diversity, inclusion, and they were going to bring in, and it, it, it came off of the back of affirmative action in the 70s and the 80s, and then diversity, inclusion in the 90s. They had HR managers being trained on it. They had people from all over the company coming in and getting trained on it, but nothing changes. It's systemic racism. Um, and nothing changes because it's institutional racism and it's designed that way. But we've had this over and over again, just like today, diversity and inclusion, nothing changes. And we've done it, you know, it's, it's just zero, 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 zero effect. And um, what has happened, let me make this one point, and I know all of you ladies can agree, is that they replaced the affirmative action and diversity with white women straight up white women white women answers the call okay white women answers it all we got white women in these positions we're going to hire white women we're going to promote white women and there goes our diversity and i think the point that we need to explain because i don't think everyone understands that piece of a white woman in a dei position and so when we go back years ago and, you know, you had the women's right movement and even when they said, you know, they were looking at like employment and equal rights and and, and it, a lot of people thought it was just for blacks. Like, you know, that this is so that blacks can get jobs because blacks are not getting into these positions. But also white women were being left out of corporate America at one point, too. So they were also included in that. So a, a way, one way that a lot of companies are covering themselves is like Dawn said, they will put a white woman in a DEI position, but they've covered their bases because they've hired a woman. They hired a white woman because white women were left out. Um, and hey, if it comes to a lawsuit, they're still okay because she was one of the people that were included. Now, if they can get a white woman that's gay, then they doing real well. Or if they can get a white woman that has a disability, they really covered all of their bases. So when we start thinking about equal, equal opportunities, it really wasn't designed just for Blacks, that white women were included in that. And for the longest, white women were hired over everyone else is also why they get paid more than black women and the reason that a white man because corporate america at one point was filled with white men white men are going to hire people that they are comfortable with who are they comfortable with first a white woman over over anybody else a black man a black woman or a woman uh, or a person of color that white woman is going to be the person that they look to 
first. So that's kind of to clarify what Dawn is speaking on. And if you y'all don't believe us, go look it up because it's it's out there. But yes, that is exactly what is happening. So thank you so much for 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 sharing that and clearing that up for us too, Dawn, of of who's really getting the position, you know. Um, Y'all and, and y'all can on LinkedIn put in DEI and see who all come up. You will be pleasantly surprised. Pleasantly surprised. Like Dr. Carey, I have something I'd like to add. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, um, as I previously mentioned, um, I was the regional manager for Operation War Speed, and that was for the vaccination program that started under President Donald Trump. So let me um, clarify what I meant when I said people that are in representative positions are so-called elected, if that helps to put it into the proper perspective, um, people. So I don't know how many people on the line voted for Joe Biden or who were over the moon happy when he appointed Kamala Harris as his vice president. But um, I had the unfortunate opportunity of um, working um, with these people vicariously. And when I was going through all of my issues with people um, targeting me, the microaggressions, um, who were more concerned about my hair than the vaccination that I was covering, and I called the White House and I asked to speak to Vice President Kamala Harris's office. Um, I got crickets. And when George Floyd's um, family was celebrating and they were standing next to President, you know, they were talking to President Joe Biden and he was congratulating them on finally getting accountability for what that officer did to Mr. Floyd. Mr. Biden was standing on my neck at the same time. Because when I was making his people aware of what I was going through, they told me that I needed to call a lawyer or follow up with someone else. And I said, I'm sorry, I would prefer to talk to the people that I elected and put into power who have the initiative and everything in place to do what they can to actually remedy this problem today. You're telling me that the president who just made the announcement that he cares about black lives, doesn't care about the same black life that's working right underneath his administration, trying to protect the people of color who are dying at, oh my God, pandemic size numbers because they are being kept out of the loop. So tears were coming down my face because I had to ask the Biden administration, not the Trump administration. I asked the Biden administration if Black lives matter. Because if our lives truly matter, then everything we're talking about tonight, they could, there's people in power that could do something about it. If people wanted to really do something about equality, we wouldn't have an equality issue. If people really wanted to do something about systemic racism, we wouldn't have a systemic racism issue. If people truly wanted to give the so-called DE&I um, tokenisms that they throw at us um, real teeth, they would actually fortify them. And the most comical, the biggest joke of all is the EEOC. If the EEOC really could do what they were designed to allegedly do, we would not have microaggression and macroaggression in the workplace. But yeah, but don't, don't get me this. started on EEOC. Yeah. Don't don't get yeah. me started it's, on it's, them people right. over there. Exactly. Um, you know, they actually re-victimize you when you're going through the whole process of telling them what happened to you. And you have lawyers, so-called lawyers, that claim to be um, employee uh, and advocates and that they are looking out for your best interest. And those same people will turn around and tell you, well, if you can't give me a smoking gun, I can't help you. And I'm sorry to say that racism today is not the same as racism in the days of Martin Luther King. They don't lynch you with literal ropes, but they will lynch you in your paycheck. They will lynch you in your title. 
They will lend you in determining where you can live, how you can feed your children because they keep you down. And no matter how hard you struggle to try and make it up to the top, they will never allow you to do that because they think you are a threat when you are too visible because of the pigmentation that you are in. And until there is no longer a high price for black women and women of color to pay for speaking out, then we will constantly be paying the price and electing people who only love us on election day and forget what we even look like or that we even exist after they're in office. I've seen it yeah. more times than I can count. And yeah, it happens. It happens. It happens constantly for us that, and I think it's this ongoing cycle of abuse that we have become conditioned to, that we become numb to some of the stuff that continues to happen to us in society, or we've been conditioned to believe that at some point is going to get is going to get better and and it 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 doesn't it it hasn't you know all of us on here are degreed women and we all have a couple of degrees like you know we're not chump change but when we were younger it happened to our moms it happened to our grandmothers like we've seen this cycle going over and over again that i think the difference is that now it's women like my mom, like Tammy, like Don, like Danny that are speaking up and saying, I'm going to share my story and hopefully it will help someone else. Like, you know, because we found our peace and, and however we did it, if it meant starting a business, you know, going get another job where they appreciated us, we figured out how to to find our peace but there's so many people out there tammy like you said that they're holding on to these false hopes that 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 these the people that we've elected that look like us are really going to advocate for us and then when we put them in office they forget who we are but then all of a sudden their nationality go back to something else like now, now I don't even identify with y'all. I'm going back to, you know, black lives really don't matter that much. Black women really don't matter that much. Y'all matter when we need you to do something for us, but the buck stops there. Like you don't matter every 24 seven, you matter sometimes. So Dr. ladies. Dr. Carey. Yes, ma'am. Let me uh, let me say this. Um, I had the opportunity uh, before I came on to the show here to <clears throat> host uh, the lead attorney, Pam Keith, for the first and epic class action suit that has been filed by 10 black women against the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department. And I hosted her in my clubhouse room called Shut Them Down. Thank you, Dr. Carey, for that that idea. And, <laughs> and it's called Shut Them Down, Black Women, Solutions for Black Women in the, in, uh, in the Workplace. But we're hosting her, um, and, we, and believe it or not, we are talking about this stuff in this room, uh, just like we're talking here. But you're so right. We have got to just not be afraid anymore to say what we're going to say, not to write it down. You know, documentation beats conversation, in my estimation. This is being... Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Documents. Someone said, how do we begin to fight all of this? Now, my lawn is our social worker in a house. I'm a former social worker. But a social worker will tell you, what are we going to tell you, my lawn? You need to document everything. Have a paper trail. If you don't document it, it didn't happen. Yes. Yes. Document, document. You keep a copy at your house. Yes. You don't keep the copy at work. You don't put it on your work computer. You take it home. So when they go through your computer and wipe out everything, when they think you're doing something or they break into your office, like I had them do at a job that I worked at to try and get the documentation, I had to the documentation home with me. It never stayed at work. And everybody got CC'd emails. So I said, if I came up missing, because, you know, sometimes people come up missing behind crazy stuff like this. I had more paper trails than the law would allow. 
because sometimes it gets real, real. And I think that's what people have to understand that, you know, when black women are complaining on a job and people keep telling us, well, it's going to be OK, it's going to get better or it, it can't be that bad. The hell it can't. And yes, it is. We go through some stuff. Then if y'all ain't got nothing from these last week and this week, we didn't wait till next week. Because, again, I got four more women that's going to come on here and tell you about their toxic work experiences. Like, y'all, it is real. And the women that are in the chat are telling you this is real. And I just think it's beautiful that we can come together and we can talk about our experiences in a safe space because all spaces are not safe spaces and so we have to realize when can we talk where can we talk how can we talk so again you know we got to be careful what we do be careful what you say be careful who you're saying it to it's a lot of things that black women have to go through just to work a nine to five am i right ladies Absolutely. And there needs to be, um, in my estimation, instead of pips, if we're going to start, if we're going to do pips, because we know those aren't going away, well, let's start doing ARIPs, anti-racism improvement, anti-racism improvement plans. Let's start doing that. Let's start applying that to the microaggressions that we are experiencing because of pro professionally transmitted anger. Let's talk about that as a disease. Yes. And as we're talking about diseases, we're going to go on into our last question for the night. And how have toxic workspaces impact your mental health, physical and or financial health? So I'm going to start with my lawn. You the social worker. So sometimes we you out there helping everybody else and you forget to help yourself. How has being in toxic workspaces impacted you, either mentally, physically, or financially? Let's just take all three. Um, because I I don't work or my career has never been in corporate America. It's always been a nonprofit. So when most people think about nonprofit, they think of community. They think of um, these great things. They don't think about the issues that black women have to go through or people of color have to go through within the workplace of nonprofits. And so you already are hit financially because most nonprofits don't pay that well, especially if you compare them to the for-profit world. Um, and if you're already overworking me, making me do things outside of my job description and not paying me that well, and probably have bad benefits as well, finances are automatically hit as soon as I accept the job. And then you create this toxic work or you perpetuate it because it was already there. It didn't just show up before I got there. It might have been masked a little bit. Um, mental health wise, I remember having a job where I gained probably 35 pounds within six months. Um, and I didn't realize that it was an issue until... I start like my clothes start being real, real tight. And I'm like, I'm not, what's, what's going on? And then I start thinking about like, I don't really want to go to work. Although I love working with my clients and I've always had a job where I work directly with community, community, families, individuals. Um, and it wasn't, I even no longer enjoyed working with them and it wasn't them. It was the environment that I was in. So it impacted my job, it impacted my mental health, it impacted my physical health, it impacted my finances just, just because. Um, and so like everything was impacted and it was supposed to be a space where if we're teaching other people to be better and we're cultivating a toxic space, how do you expect your workers to actually produce the best work? Um, but you're also looked at as if you're supposed to, no matter what circumstances you're in. And that's literally like a slogan for social workers. We make stuff happen. Um, no matter what situation we're placed in. And that's also the biggest problem. Yeah, I found that to be a, a big problem when I was a social worker was that you're 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 supposed to go always go in and save the day, but nobody saves the day for you, which was like my turning point when I just left the field. 
because it was just like, how am I in a, you know, and I, I'll put it out there that I think social work is one of the most racist professions that's out there um, because of how blacks are used and then we are discarded. Um, we go into the trenches was what I found. I did when, you know, people were just like, one day I thought about it after I left the field and I said, you know, I put in all this work and, and I had all these degrees and certifications. And I said, I was never hired for a management position. I was never hired to work in the office and be cute like the white girls. I had to go out in the trenches and do the home visits in the neighborhoods where the, the kids, they daddy was a drug dealer or their mama was a crackhead. Like they sent me to those houses and didn't realize the impact that it had on me till my hair started falling out. Like my lawn said, one day your pants don't fit and you just sitting there like, but I didn't know why the pants didn't fit because half the time I didn't eat. Like I wasn't eating, hair falling out, chronic migraines. And you don't associate it to your job until for me, it was when I left the job and all of those things went away. And I was like, dang, my job made me ill. And I actually had an older doctor that kept saying, baby, you don't have no hobbies. You can turn into another job because I don't, we running tests and ain't nothing coming back. I think this just, and I was just be like, no, your job can't make you sick. And she's just like, yeah, I, 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 I disagree. You have a stressful job. Um, but I think the stress, it wasn't the stress of the job. I think it was the dodging, the microaggressions, the racism, the discrimination. I think it was more of that that stressed me out than the clients. The clients were fine. You knew how to deal with them. So thank you for sharing that. Who else? How has your work environment impacted you either mentally, physically, or financially? Well, you know, starting out as a young engineer, and what I went through, I didn't realize that um, I was depressed. I didn't realize that I had anxiety and that I didn't even want to go into work. You know, why didn't I want to go into work? And I started internalizing it, even questioning why I was even born. You know, I mean, because it had gotten that bad, but I had not associated with it with stress. No one was there in a leadership role. And I think this is one of the things that we can do collectively is to help generations that are here and generations to come to understand the signals and the signs of what they're in when they're in it. Because I didn't have anyone to talk to from a minority female perspective to say, hey, Don, this is what's going on. You know, you need to check this out. You need to do this. You need to de-stress. I didn't have that. And the only thing that saved me, to be honest, was turning my life over to Christ. That's what saved me in this, in this whole thing was that I could go and I could cry out to God. And I knew God had created me and that God loved me because at some points I didn't even love myself. Even though I had all these things accomplished from a world perspective, I still didn't love myself. So where did that come from? That came from indoctrination of them telling us, we weren't worth anything. We're not good. You're not good in math. You, you can't speak properly. All those things accumulate and they weigh on us and we don't talk about it. We just shrug it off and keep on moving. And I think for everyone who's listening that take a moment and really assess what is going on with you because at the end of the day, when you scratch the surface, it is deeply rooted with the things that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in this country, maybe internationally in the world. You know what I mean? Oh, yes, definitely know what you mean. So I know my faith has gotten me through a lot of situations where I, you know, could have went to work and went postal. And it was just, you know, let me go have my moment with Jesus before I be the laid hands on somebody, literally, you know. Um, but like you said, I think a lot of that is conditioned, um, that we feel that we've been told so for so long that we have to be twice as good or three times as good, which really tells you that you're not good enough. 
So you got to keep working harder and harder so you can have that seat at the table so that you can have that corner office that overlooks the downtown of the city that you're in only to realize that you have everything that you need. It's not going to be given to you because of the color of your skin, not because of the content of your character. Like it's, it's totally different. Tammy, how has it impacted you? Oh my goodness. Well, um, in my chapter, I share a lot about how this has um, impacted me mentally, physically, and financially. Um, I'm going to just say that um, one of the things that hurts the most is the people who are hurting you in these toxic work spaces actually know that they're hurting you. Um, because I had one of the people who was targeting and victimizing me, she actually approached me when I was in the middle of having an anxiety attack because of something she was doing to me. And she had the power and control to make sure that I could not leave the office to even take care of myself. She told me, and I'm sure you're a very strong black woman and you can handle this. Well, let me tell you, ladies, yes. You can handle it. You're a strong black woman. Being a strong black woman is killing us. Mentally, I literally tried to walk that walk and talk that talk for so long that I was on the verge of wanting to commit suicide because I thought if all these other black women are so strong and they're able to take this, what in the world is wrong with me that I'm having anxiety attacks and hives and I'm I'm just suffering and I'm falling apart and my hair is falling out and then same people who have my hair falling out want to ask me questions about my hair. So I'm like, what is it about me that makes me so weak, so fragile that I can't bear this weight? And I thought, you know, this is just too much. This is day in and day out. I was married to a military service member and even he didn't have to be in theater war every single day, but that's how I felt being black was always a condition that I would have to deal with, always a situation that I would have to be aware of. Am I safe when I go to work here? Am I safe or allowed to be in this particular space? Can I bring my baby with me into this space? This is something that other women who are white will never ever have to worry about and deal with and come to terms with. And they can't always relate to us when we're trying to share these things with them. But at some point, having been through all these toxic workplaces, it took a toll on my marriage. And my husband, who is white, finally told me that he needed to file for a divorce because I must hate white people. And that's why I'm having all of these things happen to me in these workplaces, because he just can't for the life of him understand how black women are suffering so much. We must be angry. And I sat there as I was thinking about everything that I had gone through and signing the divorce papers. And I thought, how much have I paid? How high has the price been to be black and female in America and just trying to earn a living, just trying to be loved in the skin that you were in? That is why I decided to tell my story because we do need our own historians. And until then, it's the men in our lives, it's the people that we work with. None of them will ever truly understand what we have been through, what black women have continued to struggle through every single day, day in and day out, until they have to walk a mile in our shoes and spend the day in the skin that we are in, the skin that we cannot escape, the skin that we can't breathe in. You know, we just want to breathe, but we're not allowed to because if we breathe too loudly, we can be penalized for it. If we speak up for ourselves, the same rights that other people have, if someone has stepped on their toes and they can say, ouch, if you say, ouch, it might be too doggone aggressive. So we got to get rid of you because you offended somebody. So I just, I just think that, you know, it has taken too much from me too much, more than I can even put a price tag to.
Um, it's, it has stolen even the relationship I had with my mother. I'm going to share this and then I'm going to just shut up. But I was in a situation at a job that was so toxic that my mother was dying in hospice and I was crying and begging, please give me the right to go and say goodbye to my mother. And I was told that because I was in a clinical setting that nobody is getting time off. Nobody. Well, it turns out white women and Asian women were getting time off to go to parties and weddings, but I could not say goodbye to my mother. They would not let me say goodbye. And there were people in my family who said, well, I would have just walked out the door, but it's like, you can't walk out when your husband's already walking out the door and you have babies that are depending on you to feed them. And you've got the lights to worry about keeping on. No, we have paid and paid and paid a price that is way too high. And it's time for us to stop paying the price. It is time for us to stop paying the price. These are precious things that are being stolen from us, our health, our mental stability. And you can't get it back. All these pieces that we've given away, you can't get it back. So I just want to send all my love out to all the women that are out there of color who have been through it. You have to tell your story. You cannot be afraid to tell your story because your story is going to help every woman of color coming behind you. But the price, the price has been too, it's been too hot. Thank you. I just want to say, I agree with you, Tammy. Um, and I validate your your experiences. I validate your feelings. Women in the chat are, are sending you hugs and saying amen, and they validate you. And I agree, Tammy. It's just like the price that we pay as Black women is too high. And when does being strong, when when can we stop being strong? And, and when can we just be vulnerable and just be ourselves? And when can we have those moments? You know, um, it's, it's, it, it really feels like at times that slavery really hasn't ended. Just the plantation has changed. Now it's, it's, it's called corporate America, but Black women are still disposable. And we are not supposed to be able to grieve. We're not supposed to be there for our families. And yes, you are right. Sometimes husbands and family members don't understand. And you and I had that conversation, you know, and I said, Tammy, you know, hey, I was being sexually harassed at work and a guy I was dating. What did I tell you? I said, he was just like, were well, you okay, huh? Oh, all right then. And he kept, went on to do something. Like, it didn't connect with him because I was supposed to be the strong black woman. And because I didn't have that support like you, you find yourself again. It's just like, well, the people that I love don't even support me. And we start to take it personal. And then it's in, we eat away at ourselves internally. And then we have stuff like our parents who are elderly and they're sick and they're dying. And you have a job that tells you you can't be there. Like, when, when can we stop being strong? And when can we just be a black woman, just like white women get to be white women, Asian women get to be Asian women, but nobody says you have you have to be a strong Asian woman. You have to be a strong white woman. Black women are the only ones who have this burden that's put on their back that we're supposed to carry the problems for everyone and we're supposed to be the solution. Like, so thank you so much for your transparency and, and for sharing that. And we're going to close out with Danny. So Danny, how has the toxic workspace impacted you either mentally, physically, or financially? Well, I think the thing that, that the way it impacted me the most was it just made me question my professionalism. It made me question my ability to do what I've been doing all my life. And when you are in a sea of iniquity and inequity, 
um, which is designed to marginalize you, you start to, it's like, it's like being in a, 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 a abusive marriage. You, you're gaslighted. You start to question everything. You're wondering if you're the one that's insane. Uh, you, you know, you just, you just question everything about yourself. And that's, that's what a toxic workplace does. It is designed to do that though. And so um, when we decide that we are strong Black women for our families, but that our corporate America is not our family. See, that we need to start making the di dis distinction. See, when we leave our families, we have not walked into a place that values us. It is designed to take our labor so that we can till the soil that is directly germinated by seeds of hatred. And so until we decide we are not going to be your strong black woman, then we will start relieving ourselves. And, and, the, and, and the, entire, the entire foundation is gonna shift because see now I'm not going to live up to your expectation so that you can deliberately exclude me. That's how it affected me. It helped me to become a thought leader for myself and my family. Thank you so much, Danny. And you, you, again, you're right. Like we, we're disposable. We are, we are only there as labor. And I think a lot of times we see with our white counterparts and our Asian counterparts, how they are brought into the fold and it feels like a family for them. It's never been a family for us. We've never been seen as a family member. We've only been seen as disposable labor. I think the other thing when we talk about changing the narrative and we talk about solutions, one thing is we need to change our language. And so we need to stop saying strong black woman and we need to start saying powerful black woman because black women are very powerful. We have proven that to you all tonight and last, last week when we were on here, we are training VPs of companies we're training them to be the VP of a company. We're training them to be executives. We're going in there and we're getting them. Danny, would you say 10 million? Like we, we are, we are, we are resourceful. And so in us being resourceful, we are also powerful because if we can go into the corporate plantation and we can do that for them, Imagine what we can do if we collectively come together and do it for ourselves. The language needs to change and we need to stop putting that label on us of being a strong black woman. I also think that we need to stop begging people to listen to us because believe it or not, from what we have shared tonight, they listen to us. They also see us. They pull out our strengths and then they use that for us to build their companies, to help them to make millions. And then when we've done all that we can do for them, they find a way to get rid of us. To, and we don't realize that that set up, like Danny said earlier in this broadcast, it is a chess game. And you are just a piece that they are trying to knock off the board once they have figured out how to win the game without you. Like these are things that, that we need to understand and begin to, to relate to. But again, if you're watching this tonight, I want you to stop saying that you are a strong black woman. And I want you to start saying you are a powerful black woman. I want you to think about your strengths and your assets and what you bring to a company and think about how can you channel that into your community, into your family, into yourself? How can you begin to advocate for yourself and for other black women? But it starts with us and it's going to end with us. And we have shown you tonight 
collectively, we have the power and we have the education and we have the resources to make it happen. But we have to sit down and say that this is something that we are no longer going to be afraid of. We're no longer going to be silent. We're no longer going to allow this to tear our families apart like it's been doing since slavery. Enough is enough. And I think collectively we have we have come together and voiced that in a beautiful way tonight. This panel has done a phenomenal job. They have been emotional. If y'all transparency, it don't get any transparent than what we got tonight. This y'all out here crying and got tissue in this chat going on, and y'all went to church and came back home like. We can do this, but we have to start believing in ourselves as black women and we have to change our own narratives, but it definitely can be done. So we're about to close out tonight. So, A, I want you to remember to grab a copy of the book that is coming out. Pre-orders are taking place now um and there are limited copies of the pre-orders if you want to autograph copy these ladies are going to share their websites with you and how you can connect with them if you like them to come and speak for your organization or you want to grab a copy of the book from them but the upcoming anthology that we've been talking about is everyday struggle how toxic workspaces impact black women so my lawn let everybody know where they can reach out to you and they can get a copy of the book and if they need you to come speak or be a consultant how they can get in touch with you <laughs> So um, I can be reached at advocating the number four change.com. Again, it's advocating A D V O C A T I N G, the number four C H A N G E dot com. Um, and all of my social media is attached to that website, as well as how to pre order the book, and also if you need any consulting services. And they can also connect with you on LinkedIn. She has Absolutely. LinkedIn profile. So y'all go go follow her right now. We're going to follow all of these beautiful black women tonight. Tammy, let them know where they can find you. Okay, so I'm going to make it very easy. Um, look me up on LinkedIn and I will repost information so that if you are trying to get a copy of the book or you would like for me to personally come out and speak, or do something uh, virtually for your group or your community, please do reach out again, Tammy Aby, right there on LinkedIn. All right, thank you, Tammy. And Dawn, where can they find you? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn. And I um, started a new platform called Say It Loud Black Sister.com. So they can find all my information on Say It Loud blacksister.com as well as reach me on linkedin all right and danny everyone i just put my uh website in the chat you can reach me at www.danny with an e 10k.com all my social media links are there and you will also be able to get the uh shut them down book that preceded everyday struggles as well if you'd like thank you Yes, yes. Please don't forget the first anthology was Shut Them Down, um, Black Women, Racism in Corporate America. And October is the one year anniversary that that book uh, was released. So Danny has actually both books um, and you can get an autographed copy of Everyday Struggle from any of the ladies that are on tonight. All of these ladies are on LinkedIn. So if you didn't catch their website, you can connect with them on LinkedIn um, and get more information from them. Again, thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. Thank you to everyone who has um, just allowed us to pour into you for the last hour and a half. We were only supposed to be on here for an hour, y'all, okay? And this conversation got so good, I was like, I can't stop this, okay? You know, God just ain't going to be nice to me if I cut this after an hour. So, you know, forgive us, but it was a conversation that I think we definitely needed to have, people needed to hear. Um, and yeah, we needed to get some transparency. 
To learn more about me, please feel free to visit my website, drkiriyazid.com. And I'm also here on LinkedIn. But if you're watching this broadcast, we're probably connected or you are following me. So make sure you join us next Thursday, same time, same place. I will have four more ladies who are contributing authors for the anthology, and we will be continuing this conversation. Until then, make sure you share the replay out with a friend who missed it, but girlfriend needs to hear it. Thank you all for joining us. Have a good night.